Are we normal, those of us who have like a low sex drive? And it's kind of hard to say what is low, right? I might consider it low compared to my friends. So, or maybe they have a really high sex drive. So where do we dive into this topic? To the Strong Mom channel. Today we are talking about low sex drive, low libido after having a baby and what you can do to get it back. Today our expert uh, who I'm chatting with is Jessica DuPont. She is a Dr. Jessica DuPont. She is a naturopathic doctor. She's a birth doula, a fertility specialist, public speaker, mother, plant-based foodie. Her practice focuses on hormonal regulation, women's health, um, and fertility and perinatal care. Dr. Jessica has made it her mission to empower women worldwide to embrace their divine feminine power, take control of their health, and realize their optimal health potential so that they can feel energetic, vibrant, and beautiful inside and out. She integrates conventional medical research with alternative medicine, giving women a unique approach to their health so that they can get to the root causes of their concern and restore balance. I think that's so important that you mentioned the root cause, right? <laughs> um, Dr. DuPont is the creator of the, of the Naturopathic Doula course and teaches naturopathic doctors across North America and the UK. Uh, she's the founder of York Region Naturopathic Doulas and is the creator of the noteworthy online fertility program baby bloomers she has published various articles for um, a variety of health magazines and papers and is one of the most sought after practitioners in the gta that's greater toronto area regarding hormones pregnancy and fertility so dr jessica thank you so much for joining us today i am really excited about this because we're diving into the you know, the things that we all whisper about to our friends. I just don't feel like it. You know, I don't want to have sex. I'm just tired or, you know, all these things. And I know so many of us have questions. Um, and I want to get into not just low sex drive after immediate postpartum. I'm talking about <clears throat> for some of us who are like five years or more postpartum. So Jazz, this is such a huge topic. So I'm not even sure where we should begin, but please tell me that we are not, um, tell me this is normal. Like, are we normal, those of us who have like a low sex drive? And it's kind of hard to say what is low, right? I might consider it low compared to my friends. So, or maybe they have a really high sex drive. So where do we dive into this topic? Oh gosh, like you said, it, the topic is is huge. And I think you do need to distinguish between what's normal and what's common and not necessarily normal. Definitely right. the first year postpartum, you're gonna wax and wane and you're gonna go all over the place. I am almost two years postpartum now and I'm still at that low libido phase. So I feel like it's a really good topic to talk about right now because I'm mm -hmm. totally there. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like right. Be you like getting better by now, but <laughs> right. It's like, well, and like you said, you're like, I'm five years out and I'm still right like, on this downswing. And it's funny because, um, five years postpartum, you should have your libido back. And we'll talk about maybe why that, that isn't the case, but you'll also notice that once your menstrual cycle returns with women, our men's to our libidos will actually increase at specific times of our cycle and will okay. be lower at other times in our cycle where men it's like a daily fluctuation okay. right so they wake up and their hormones are raging right so their <laughs> libido is highest in the morning and then it's kind of lower in the afternoon and okay like, women it's not a daily thing like that it's more the rhythm of their cycle so we should definitely okay. get into that at some point but sure we can definitely start by just discussing kind of the hormones involved in libido and how that shifts sort of immediately after birth and, and, you know, how that affects our libido and how that libido shifts, you know, uh, if you're breastfeeding, if you're not breastfeeding, what happens when you're weaning, what happens when your period returns, because the libido could shift at That's, any okay. point. So let's start there. Let's start talking about po like immediate postpartum. And also just to clarify, does is libido the sex hormone like i think about sex drive and libido are they the same thing they are the same thing so libido is a term that we commonly use to describe sexual drive or like a desire for sexual activity so 
drive is kind of that biological component. So it manifests as sexual thoughts or fantasies, that erotic attraction, right. and actually like physically seeking out sexual activity. Right. Um, and sex drive varies a lot from woman to woman and often varies kind of from day to day, depending even on like stress levels and what you're eating and, right. you know, so many, and sleep, like so many things drive that. So the libido really is, and sex drive are used interchangeably. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Like, because in my mind, I think it's hormonal, right? After having a baby, it's hormonal. Like I waited six months, right? I waited six months and then I was like, okay, now I'm ready. I mean, you know, there's a lot going on down there, which yeah. makes us want to wait, but right. you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of that I, I'm just like so busy. Uh, I I've got this new baby. I'm not getting sleep. So yeah. let's talk about immediate postpartum yeah. and, um, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. So immediately postpartum, women go through the most drastic shift of hormones that they will in the lifetime, even mm -hmm. more than menopause, right? Because menopause is a gradual thing. Okay. So what happens is in pregnancy, your estrogen and your progesterone are the highest they'll ever be, right? And then you give birth and within three days, they go whoop, into the toilet, <laughs> right. right? Because our prolactin goes up to help bring in our breast milk. Okay. And it also helps with... Um, that feeling of calm, mm -hmm. um, oxytocin goes up, you know, during labor itself because of the, you know, helping with contractions. It'll also help with milk expression. And that is kind of helps with our bonding with our baby. But when prolactin goes up, it shuts estrogen and progesterone down. So estrogen is obviously our main female hormone. It's right. secreted by our adrenal glands and our ovaries. So we, we tend to think of it just as like, oh, it's just produced by our ovaries, but it actually is you know, is produced in the adrenal glands as well, which is why stress and mm -hmm. cortisol play such a critical role here. Right. Um, so, so now we're dealing with low estrogen. We know that estrogen being up actually drives up more of a, of a libido, right? And our testosterone drives up libido. Now, progesterone is kind of that opposite hormone that as progesterone rises, it lowers libido. So we're going to get there. Okay. But with estrogen being really, really low, our libido is already dropped. Plus we're already, we're thinking more about like bonding with that baby. We're all about the baby, baby, baby. We're not thinking about our partners at this yeah. point. In fact, you know, <laughs> you just gave birth. The last thing on your mind is sex. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's, there's hormones involved here. Also, like you said, the stress, you know, and the overwhelm of just, you know, lack of sleep. Maybe you mm -hmm. don't have enough support. Maybe you're not eating well because, you know, you're all about the baby at that point and you're trying to learn how to breastfeed. So there's that part and that piece and cortisol and cortisol is up. That's going to shut down testosterone and, and estrogen as well. It's going to kind of drive down hormones. And so you need to be very careful with, with cortisol, but, uh, even like ongoing the first few weeks, postpartum, uh, postpartum first few months, postpartum, um, if you're still breastfeeding, of course, those, those, um, hormones are going to stay really low. Okay. And so you're also dealing with, you know, just like I said, so much other stuff, plus the physical, right. Of, of dealing with kind of postpartum, um, don't touch my body. <laughs> with that. I said, don't touch my body. Don't come near right. me. Like your, your breasts might be sensitive plus feeling overtouched, especially if you're breastfeeding. Yeah. I mean, I'm just like, don't touch them. Like just, yeah. it's, it's honestly become like just a non-sexual thing. Now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I know it might feel sexual to you, but it really does not to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, but a big mental piece too is you know will intercourse be painful mm -hmm. how do I know if I'm ready do I look different down there what if my partner uh doesn't enjoy sex with me because women have this idea that their vaginas are going to feel wider and more right. open and temporarily that might be the case but everything goes back yeah <laughs> yeah there's this these myths that we and these stories that we make up in our head and that we're not going to be desirable about our partners anymore so I think that women also need to kind of get over that piece too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So immediately postpartum you're dealing with this huge shift in hormones your libido is going to just tank right uh, and then depending on if you're breastfeeding or not that will depend on you know what your hormones do going forward so usually 
I I, rem- I never talked about sex with my uh, midwife. I don't think it was like you know the the six. Uh, most people get the six or the eight week checkup. The okay, mm-hmm. you can start to exercise. You can have sex again. I don't even think I, that was even on my mind. But I I believe that's when they will give you the clear to um, engage in intercourse again. So at that point. Is it just, okay, that's the last interaction with your doctor and they're like, you're good to go? Or is there something hormonal that happens at that that time that... I guess, I guess it's everything, right? It's things are healed. If you've had um, a C-section or if you've had episiotomy, things are quite healed down there that you can probably begin uh, to have yeah. intercourse. So yeah. let's, I know you just talked about hormones everywhere. I'm like, oh, producer, producer, like all these things. So moms who are breastfeeding, um, let's, you know, talk about moms. I breastfed for a year. How long did you bre- breastfeed? My first, I breastfed for 22 months. Okay. This one is 18 months now and I'm still going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's never ending, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so so what's happening to us during that time? So breastfeeding, or is breastfeeding a time when we would have a lower libido and then when we stop breastfeeding, we would have a higher libido? So it's very interesting you say that. Um, so going back to kind of your first in your first discussion about the six to eight week mark, our hormones are not shifting drastically at that point. It is basically, this is the last appointment with your doctor, which is unfortunate. And we're really trying to change that, right? Because really women in the postpartum period should have way more appointments in their first year, even two years postpartum, because there's so much physiological changes happening. Um, But it really is that physical piece. That's usually when they say, okay, things are healed down there. It's really up to you now if you want to move forward. Right. Some women heal quicker, some heal later. So I hate kind of saying, oh yeah, at six weeks, you're good to go. I really do feel like so much of that is like pelvic floor work as well. Mm -hmm. And you do a lot of pelvic floor. I'm sure there's a lot of women who at six weeks aren't ready physically or mentally and emotionally. And so, um, and then when, okay. So then if we go back to now your question about, do we have low libido when we're breastfeeding and then does it go up when we're weaning? Not necessarily. And here's why. So when we're breastfeeding, it's going to be that typical high prolactin because that's keeping our milk supply going. So that, that prolactin is going to drive down your estrogen, right? right? That's going to drive down your libido. And while, while prolactin and oxytocin are elevated, you're going to have that bonding with your baby, that attachment to your baby. So sexual intercourse is not something that's kind of our immediate thing on our mind. Right. Um, so you would assume then that when we discontinue breastfeeding, our prolactin will drop and estrogen and progesterone will come back up. So our libido should return. Right. In hindsight, right. <laughs> but immediately it's actually going to be quite the opposite. So I don't know if you remember weaning, but a lot of women don't realize that when they start weaning their hormones, like you'll get irritable, frustrated. You might break out into night sweats. There's just so much going on. Okay. And you don't understand. You're like, what's going on here all of a sudden? You don't even realize it's because you're weaning and your hormones are trying to kind of get oh, back to normal. Okay. So prolactin will drop as yeah. you wean. So it will trigger though a huge increase in estrogen and progesterone. Yay, that's a good thing. Which is a good thing. <laughs> but like sometimes long. what happens is while it's trying to balance, it's too high. And when mm. estrogen is too high, um, you get this estrogen dominance picture. So then yeah. more PMS, more heavy periods, um, just you know, heavy periods, more clots, uh, you, more irritability and moodiness. And so again, um, your body just doesn't feel like you want to have intercourse. You might be so irritable with your partner. You're like, get out of my face, you know, right. that sort of thing. Uh, but it should kind of regulate out, you know, within a few months of weaning. But the other thing is like, you're going from, you know, maybe either avoiding intercourse or having very minimal intercourse to now assuming that you're just going to want it all the time. It's probably not going to be that way. You kind of, it's, you know, you're still, you still have a baby. You still have, um, you just maybe not sleeping well, they're up all night. You may be, um, working, you know, there's still stress and there's still right. thyroid. There's still so many other factors that could be at play here. Mm-hmm. So we don't always blame the hormones. There might be other things at play driving down sex drive. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So, <laughs> so weaning, I guess, starts to become a good thing. And then mm, it, you could overshoot it, like you said, and it could, you know, okay. So yeah. don't think that weaning is a good thing or don't think that weaning is going to make you desire it more. Weaning. And I think, you know, as well with pelvic floor stuff and the effect of estrogen on the pelvic floor too, right? That um, even having pelvic floor issues can ha- make you have a low libido, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. like just with estrogen fluctuations, it causes vaginal dryness. It changes the laxity of the joints. And right. so, you know, working on the pelvic floor is also going to help with sexual intercourse and, you know, making yeah. it less painful, increasing blood flow to the pelvic floor. Exactly. And yeah. some other things too, like, exactly. I know like a, some moms will complain, oh, it's, you know, dry. And that's why, you know, Kegels are great and doing, as I say, the pelvic floor, the blueberry pickup yeah. it just brings blood flow to the area. It may help with arousal and lubrication as well. Um, I hear a lot of like the side effects of working with me. So, you know, moms usually come to me because they want to work on their pelvic floor, diastasis recti, all that stuff. And we work Work on the pelvic floor and uh, you know a month or so later they'll say you know what this is TMI but I don't know if this is like is, am I imagining it but sex actually feels better and uh, you know but I'm like yes it's true and and you know yes we're working on 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 uh, the pelvic floor and making those muscles strong. Um, and, and like you said, a lot of moms think like after having baby, Oh, it's so loose. And it, you know, it, it, it's, it's wide or, or whatever is, is, is it going to feel as good, um, for me and my partner. But, uh, and the thing about t- t- talking about Kegels is they're great, but they're not for everyone because there's yeah. a lot of women who definitely could use the pelvic floor strengthening, but there's also a lot of us myself included, we are already hypertonic. We are already yes. tight down there, the right? And so yeah. the last thing that you want to be do is doing more squeezing Kegels and all that kind right. of thing. So um, release and let go. Yes. And that is a hard thing for type A. Anybody else who's a type A person, uh, you may <laughs> already be hypertonic. So don't think that Kegels are going to always make it better but it will definitely it can definitely help with boosting your confidence like i said uh bringing blood flow to the area which is another point i want to make um with moms and hemorrhoids and i know hemorrhoids can last a while um and so working on pelvic floor again bringing the blood flow down to the area um can help with hemorrhoids and make them um, disappear or minimize them, which also will make you more confident about down there and, yes. you know, sexual intercourse. So, exactly. um, so definitely that plays a part as well. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. So let's talk then about after breastfeeding. So we've weaned, mm-hmm. how long does it take? Like you said, when we start to wean our hormones all crazy, how long does yeah. that kind of take to steady out? I would say that you're probably looking at at least a couple of months, probably three. So when we, it it all depends too, if your menstrual cycle has returned. So usually by the time we wean, we do have our menstrual cycle back or it's coming back shortly afterward. Right. And it does take about three months for those hormones to regulate and starting to see more of like what your cycle is going to look like after birth. Mm -hmm. So it's different for everyone. I wish I can say like, oh, two weeks after you wean, it's going to go back or, you know, three weeks. I right. wish I can say that it's just so individualized, yeah. um, but your hormones, if your if your menstrual cycle has returned and you do wean probably within the next cycle or two, mm-hmm. things will start to regulate. Okay. But if your period hasn't returned and it's just about to come, you're probably looking at a good three months. Right. Right. Okay. So then what about some of us ladies who are like, yeah, it's been a few years since I've breastfed yes. and I did, it's just, it's just been the same, you know, it's just been the same. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't really desire it, but you know, like, like we just don't have that yes. <laughs> arousal. Like this is to. where, this is where I say we need to look at other factors too. Mm-hmm. So you need to see what your hormones are doing now. Right. Right. But also look at, um, diet. I know your diet's really good, but others might not be, um, exercise, look at your relationship with your partner, look at thyroid, uh, look at stress and cortisol, especially mm-hmm. like for you, for example, and I'm not diagnosing by any means, but being a type A personality, 
you might have a higher cortisol level than a lot of people. Right. And those that cortisol could be plummeting hormones, mm -hmm. right? Or your just mind is, you know, on focusing on different things right now versus reproduction. Right. But when we have higher cortisol, um, it's going to, it's kind of that fight or flight, right? Where all the blood flow goes to our limbs and our, you know, our legs and our arms running away. It's not focusing on reproduction, mm -hmm. right? So all the blood flow goes away from our reproductive organs when we're under stress. And you might not even feel necessarily that you're under stress, but there might be this underlying stress happening. You like might all the well. time. I know my mother is this person and I'm, I, every day I see myself in her. So yeah, uh, <laughs> right. But like, I know exactly. She's always on like that type A, always got to go. Yeah. And I'm the same, like, you know, my husband says that I move faster than my brain thinks it. Right. By the amount of glasses I break in the kitchen. But anyway, <laughs> you, know, you might be in like a certain um, phase of what we would call adrenal fatigue. So not mm -hmm. at the point where you're at adrenal depletion or exhaustion, but kind of in that middle phase, which we know that every woman who's postpartum, their adrenal glands plummet. Right. And if you don't right. do anything to rebuild those adrenal glands afterward, it's still going to stay the same. Even though you technically feel a little bit better, there's probably this low residing you know, adrenal right. issue happening. And so you might want to work on kind of addressing those adrenal glands and you might find that the libido shifts. Also communication mm -hmm. with partner is really important. Yes. And relationships, right? So, you know, do you feel like you can talk to your partner? Do you feel that he thinks you're sexy? Do you mm -hmm. feel sexy? Like there's so many factors here. Plus you still have two kids at home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I mean, I we're always postpartum, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once postpartum, always postpartum. It's so true. But, right. We, we, we tend to, mothers tend to not have just physical stresses, but we have this mental stress where we're just thinking all the time about oh. booking them doctor's appointments, <laughs> their schoolwork. What do we pack in their lunches? Yeah. You know, grocery. There's just so many lists going on in our minds all the time that I find exactly. a lot of dads don't think about. It's like, so we're just true. Overthinking. <laughs> It's so true. What am I making yeah. for the next meal? Let's me, let me do my grocery shopping list. Like all that stuff you said right. is so, right. so it's true. Stressful, right? Yeah. So like how much me time do you actually have? And how much time do you have to actually explore your own sexual drive? Mm -hmm. Right. So like even, um, there's all this like hesitation around the conversation of masturbation and all this, we know that like 90% of women masturbate. Okay? okay. And so why do we, why do we avoid this conversation? Mm. And if you're not masturbating, is there a reason? It, maybe it's religion, maybe it's family values, whatever it is, but right. or is it just, you know, is your desire not there? Do you not know how to? So there's all these things of arousal that women can explore right? and all these avenues, but we tend to blame our hormones. We, we could look at hormones, <laughs> but there could it's be the many other out. factors involved. I, Medications okay, it's, is another it's, one. Sorry, say that again. Medications is another yeah. one, right? Blaming our hormones is an easy out, but as you're talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to book an appointment with Jessica because maybe you're right. Maybe my, like, you know, my hormones need to be balanced and it's not an easy fix, right? It doesn't sound it's like It's not it. an easy fix. It, it's so <laughs> intricate and you have to try yeah. to find out like where the root is because even hormonal imbalance is not the cause, right? It's the symptom. Okay. And, okay. Well, why are your hormones out of balance, right? Like what's right. going on over here? So right. are there nutrient deficiencies for you? I really doubt that, but, <laughs> but you know, um, there's many, many factors that I think people need to consider. For yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah. You hit on like so many. Okay. So I want to talk about diet and nutrition and how that affects it. And then maybe you can give us some food. Somebody, I once was at a trade show and the lady speaking said, everybody eat broccoli every single day and your libido is going to go up. And I'm, I bet everybody in the room was like, Hey hun, make sure you buy like seven things of broccoli. Right? Like, so, so yeah. Okay. So I'll break down how diet and nutrition helps us. And then maybe give us some like foods that will, uh, you know, we'll uh, put on our grocery list for this week. <laughs> yeah. So our nutrition is the foundation for our health, right? So we know that yeah. we can heal anything with diet and nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, as postpartum moms, we tend not to think of ourselves. We tend yeah. to make sure our children are feeding well, you know, we worry yeah. about everyone else. But then I, I have so many patients who 
um, they don't even eat in the morning. They're like, well, I'm, I'm busy making my daughter her breakfast. And I'm like, well, why aren't you making yourself some as well? Yeah. Like, why aren't you just yeah. making extra? And they go, oh, good point, <laughs> right? Like they're you know, making oatmeal for their child, but they're not making some for themselves. I mean, right. I'm even guilty of that. And so um, timing of nutrition is really important and making sure you're getting in those three square meals plus snacks, because as soon as you start um, going four hours at a time without eating, you're, you might get blood sugar dips, especially being in the postpartum period and your adrenal glands are already fatigued. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to get blood sugar dips. Then you're going to get your adrenals are going to drop. You're going to crave carbohydrates and you're going to be craving those sugar and carbs right? and chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're having coffee on an empty stomach in the morning, the same thing's going to happen. Your blood sugar is going to spike. It's going to drop. And then you're going to be reaching for like a muffin or a croissant or right. something that's just not fulfilling. It's anti-nutrient. It's not yeah. going to benefit you in any way. So one of the biggest things I actually say, if your libido is really low, take the sugar out. Mm -hmm. Sugar is such a huge, huge culprit. It squashes testosterone, right? Which is like our huge libido driver. It raises okay. insulin um, and really depletes our energy. Okay. It can give you liver problems. And when you have liver problems, it won't be able to shuttle the glucose out of the, the bloodstream. Um, and you won't be able to metabolize your hormones properly, mm -hmm. right? So this is why even including things like bitter bitters, you know, like bitter greens, arugula, like, like right? Mustard, yeah. Like, rocket, like stuff. mustard leaf and like dandelion, yes. and all those things. Those are really beneficial for the liver right. and can actually get the liver secreting and, um, get the liver detoxing and things like that. So those are fantastic right. things to introduce. Right. I really do love, um, leafy greens. So mm -hmm. in general, what you want to focus on is whole foods, you know, nothing processed, nothing full of sugar, full of too much salt. Right. Um, even, you know, if you are having animal products, I usually say to try to even reduce them by 50%. I, I feel like a lot of people overdo it. Hmm. And you have to remember that animal products are hormone driven. Right. Right. If you're trying to balance your own hormones here, taking in hormones from exogenous sources right. is probably not right. going to be very helpful. That's especially if you're getting your animal products from, you know, just a, a typical farm, which pumps their animals with hormones and antibiotics and things, right? right. So That's something to think about there. Um, leafy greens, I love because they contain folic acid, they're high in vitamin E, magnesium and calcium, all nutrients that support not only your menstrual cycle, uh, but they also lower stress hormone and work up kind of that pleasure ante by helping mm -hmm. to raise dopamine. Level. Okay. Yes. So that will in turn increase arousal. So um, I really love your leafy greens. So what you want to try to focus on is almost like 50% of your plate being fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Your leafy greens are really important here. Broccoli is wonderful. <laughs> um, and then have, you know, maybe 25% of your plate, plate being a healthy fat or healthy protein. It doesn't necessarily have to be an animal based protein. It could be, you know, lentils, chickpeas, beans. Right. Um, and then, you know, 25% could be that healthy carbohydrate. So you don't want to go cutting out food groups here, right? Right. We need carbohydrates. We need mm -hmm. fats. It's the right fats and the right carbs, right. right? So we need our healthy fats because cholesterol makes our hormones. Mm -hmm. There's so many women who I, I have come into me and they look at my, my period disappeared, disappeared. I don't have a period anymore. And then we start going in and they're, you know, doing these crazy diets where they're yeah, either not taking in enough nutrients or they're cutting fats right. or they're over exercising to the point where, mm. you know, so we have to be very careful with that. We need those fats to support our hormone production. Right. So I'm trying to think if there's any other foods. I want to go. Lots. I want to go back to, one. I want to go back to eliminating sugar. I think that's a really big one. So yeah. eliminating sugar, when you're talking about that, we're talking like the refined sugar, like white sugar, um, baked goods, like, like you said, like yeah, those, not those, fruit. Okay. Not fruit. And no. then what about like things like potatoes and like white potatoes and white, white rice? They're okay. So those are totally fine for things okay. like libido and things like this. Um, if you have an insulin issue, a blood sugar issue, have PCOS, things like that, then you might want to look more so on taking out those, um, you know, white, white rice and white um, potato and things like that. I always say to keep gluten to a minimum just because yeah. gluten, 
there's no nutrients included. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it's an anti-nutrient. It actually depletes your B vitamins. Um, it's pro-inflammatory. So you kind of want to try to keep those pro-inflammatory foods down as much right. as you can, right? So driving down inflammation in turn, women will likely see weight loss, which usually mm -hmm. in the postpartum period, a lot of women are trying to do. Right. Um, but we do tend to kind of overreach on those carbs as a, you know, so if you are having carbohydrates, you want to have more of those unrefined grains, right? Like quinoa and uh, okay. maybe some wild rice or brown rice and those right. things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. But no it, fruit is fine. No fruit yeah. fear. Right. <laughs> I'm all about no fruit fear. <laughs> Yeah, no fruit fear. I like that. I have not heard that. I I always say I could be a fruititarian for, <laughs> for I know. sure. The five, like you're doing like yourself such a disservice. If you're starting to, you know, remove fruit from your diet, I'm just like, oh dear Lord. <laughs> because, <laughs> so because people think it's too high in sugar. And yes, there's some that are yeah. higher in sugar than others, yeah. but you don't want to eliminate it entirely for sure. For exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just when it comes to fruit, cause I'm somebody who likes dried fruit, just go easy on the dried fruit. More fresh is better. <laughs> right. Fresh is best. But I mean, if you're looking for quick snacks and things like by all means have a trail mix with some dried, you know, right. cranberries in there or dried apple, if it's going to be the thing that gets into your diet. Right. Yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah. You're right. You yeah. got to make this like as easy as possible for a mom with, you know, busy mom, busy life and baby. So exactly. For sure. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Great, great tips. Okay. Let's talk about supplements. Um, and mm -hmm. like, I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's just so many supplements. So make this as easy as possible for yeah. us. So the first thing is that, you know, any supplements I talk about, of course, making sure that people are speaking with their doctor because yeah. everyone is an individual and you should be speaking with your doctor to make sure that supplements are right for you and that they're not contraindicated with medications and whatnot or contraindicated in breastfeeding. Mm. So, um, obviously omega threes are great. Um, go ahead. Just to stop you in my mind. I don't know if doctors actually know supplements. Like I know they know medicine, but yes. do they know supplements? Some do, most don't. Okay. So talk to your naturopath, talk to your holistic practitioner, whoever, herbalist, whoever you're working okay. with. You know, just making sure that you're doing your research and not just saying, oh, well, Jessica said, take this, so I'm going to do it. Like, exactly. I don't have responsibility for that. Disclaimer, so, um, do not just buy everything that Jessica is talking oh, about because- I mean, You can talk about what supplements, you know, have been shown to help with hormone balance okay. or just to kind of keep yourself uh, or address some of the things that may be, you know, um, driving down libido. So- in general, you know, looking at a good omega-3, because that is going to give you a good healthy fats. It's going to help with hormone production. It's going to help with driving down uh, inflammation. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. I really love vitamin D. Yes. Vitamin D is a hormone. Okay. And when vitamin D is deficient, we see menstrual cycles go all over the place. Mm -hmm. We see PCOS, we see endometriosis, we see fertility issues. So vitamin D is linked to so many reproductive conditions, including low libido. And so making sure vitamin D is where it needs to be test first before you, you um, take vitamin D because it is a fat soluble vitamin and you can overdose on vitamin D. Right. Uh, I also really like zinc. Zinc is a precursor for testosterone, right? So if you're assuming testosterone is low, zinc can actually help bump up those testosterone levels. I don't know if you've ever heard of, you've probably heard of maca. Yeah. I love maca root because it's an adaptogen. So it helps right. you adapt to stress and just keep that cortisol level feeling more balanced. It's a natural mm. libido enhancer. Uh, it increases stamina and energy. It's great for both men and women. Right. So if you want to sneak that into your man's morning smoothie. I was going to say, because I used to do this years ago and I'm like, do I still have it? I'm sure it's like expired by now, but maca is, uh, so for anybody who's watching is like, what's maca? It is a root, I believe, right? Maca root, yeah. um, dried into a powder. And like you said, you can sprinkle it in a smoothie, put it in a smoothie, sprinkle it on yogurt, your cereal, whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I do love maca for that. And there's other adaptogenic herbs too, like ashwagandha and rhodiola, which are beautiful herbs that people can incorporate to, if you do feel like that stress and that adrenal piece is what's affecting you. Um, staying on a prenatal vitamin, 
I love that. It gives you all your B vitamins and higher mm. doses. It gives you the folate to help with um, testosterone production and all these things. So I usually encourage women to stay on their prenatal vitamin as long as they're okay. breastfeeding. And if they okay. can even longer, it's a wonderful multivitamin. Okay. Um, you could do B6. Vitamin B6 is a wonderful herb to help balance estrogen and progesterone. So there's so many different supplements out there, but I would say uh, working with like omega-3s, vitamin D is a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. Omega-3s are always fantastic. Both of those, omega-3 and vitamin D have been shown in research to improve depression. Right. And if you're having low mood and uh, a depression and anxiety, that could be the underlying factor in low libido, this could improve it. Um, right. If you're having gut issues, probiotics mm. are always beneficial. The gut is like right. a major hormone producer, right? So right. anytime we're trying to balance hormones, you have to balance the gut out. Right. Because if your digestion's all over the place, you're likely not going to be metabolizing your hormones effectively. Right. That's a really good point that I, yeah, didn't think about, but I want to get back to the supplements. So for, yeah. I know Jessica's talking a lot about if your hormones, this or high or low. So for those of you watching how you're going to find this out is by getting your hormone panel done by yeah. either your doctor or naturopathic doctor can, uh, would you prescribe it? How do you, how, how do you say it? Uh, so what women need to know though, is you can't just test your hormones randomly at any point in time. Like if you're oh. still breastfeeding, there's no point. Okay. Okay. Your hormones are going to be likely all really low. Okay. And so, um, you don't want to just assume, well, my, my progesterone is low, right? It's like, well, it's because you're breastfeeding. So you can test though, your vitamin D, you can test your, uh, thyroid at that point, because we know thyroid when that's out of whack will drive down, um, libido, it drives down testosterone. So it does play a huge effect in sex hormones. Um, but also you can just even look at your iron levels and your B12, which could mm -hmm. play a role when you're no longer breastfeeding, then you want to make, or when your period returns, this is where you want to test most of your hormones on day three. So definitely okay. like your estrogen, your follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. I know these are huge words, but <laughs> most of the hormones that your doctor is going to test, you want to make sure you go on day three of your menstrual cycle. If they're testing at any random time in your cycle, it's not going to be accurate. Okay. And then you want to test your progesterone seven days after you ovulate. Okay. So progesterone should be at its highest point at that time. Um, if there's no pregnancy. So you want to make sure you're testing at the right time in order to get really, really good results. Right. Otherwise you're just going to assume all oh, everything's normal and you, okay. make sure you have a doctor that interprets them correctly. Cause there's optimal levels. And this is interesting because I remember coming to my doctor after my first baby and I said, I have low libido and I don't believe this is like seven, eight years ago. I don't believe she said, let's run your hormones. It's oh, no. okay. I will write you a script to go see this. I don't even remember if it was a, a sex therapist. I have no clue, but I was like, yeah, whatever. They called me like six months later and I was like, I'm pregnant again. So we're good. I don't need this appointment. <laughs> right. So here's like, the problem. <laughs> there is a huge issue with women in general in the healthcare system because we are constantly like the situation we're in is constantly blamed for how we feel mm. like oh you're you're pregnant oh you're feeling tired while you're pregnant oh well that's just because you're pregnant right or um oh you're tired postpartum you have low libido postpartum it's just because you're postpartum right it'll pass once you know baby's older or you know so we're just constantly like oh like just told that well this is normal because you're a woman and this right. is what you know oh you have painful periods well you're a woman deal with it do you think right? or you're put on so birth complex. control or you're put on or if like you're like you know if your periods are wonky or heavy or whatever it's birth control well okay let's go on birth yeah. control like well, well how about a conversation about why this is happening like right. what's actually going on in my body i just i don't understand it, but you know I, I, I understand that this is the way kind of the allopathic medicine, this is how they, this is what they learn to do. Yeah. So they're doing what they know, which, you know, they do amazing things as well. So you just want to make sure maybe you're working with a practitioner on the holistic side that can maybe look a little bit deeper into what's actually going on and be a little bit more thorough. Exactly. So yeah. so what I want to point out is if your doctor is saying, okay, let me write a script to so-and-so, 
you can request them. I want to run my hormone panel and let's yes, investigate from advocate. there. Advocate yeah, for yourself. Advocate for yourself. Yes. And then take that, like you said, doctors might view it differently than you would, a naturopathic doctor. So feel free to take that to a naturopathic doctor to get them to also look at it. But it's interesting that you said that your progesterone you need to test at a different time than the rest. I have never gone for a hormone test where it's like, okay, you got to do this one on the third day and this on the seventh day. Like, that's unheard of. <laughs> Not with the naturopath. <laughs> okay. With a naturopath, you will definitely, they will tell you. Like, when right. I'm done. The, the thing is too, like even going to see a, most, if you were going to, to go see like an endocrinologist, Okay. Some will be very, they know about that. Cause I do right. have patients who come to me and they're like, oh yeah, I did this on day three. And I did this on day okay. 21. You know, if they ovulate around day 14 with my endocrinologist. So people who actually, uh, study hormones and that's the main part of their practice, but some still don't, it boggles my mind. Um, but you'll <laughs> notice like women going through fertility, they're very specific about when they test women's hormones, but going to see just like your GP, they don't necessarily, um, hormones isn't their thing, right. right? So they're just like, okay, let's run it. And then if they see that everything comes back within range, right? <laughs> like it's all good right? range. Because, because it's not flagged. They're just looking for things that are kind of flagged outside mm. of that range. And if it's not flagged, then they're like, it's fine. Right. right? They do that with thyroid too, because they don't, thyroid isn't their specialty. Right. So if, you're, if you want to know about your hormones, go to a doctor that like specializes in hormones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So All right. to, like, if you break your leg, go see like somebody <laughs> who like specializes in bones. Don't like, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, is there anything else that we need to talk about? We've talked about breastfeeding, not breastfeeding, weaning, diet, nutrition, supplements, uh, yeah. hormones. Um, is there anything else? There's a couple of things. Um, let's talk about periods and when they return and what that yes. looks like and why. Yes. And then also there's things beyond nutrition that women could do to kind of help with their libido and just some tips to consider. Okay. So when you probably noticed, even when your period, what did your period look like when it returned after your kids? It was awesome. Cause it was like two months after three months after I stopped breastfeeding. So I had yeah. like a man, long time without periods, which is so great. Yeah. Um, uh, humble, bright, <laughs> humble, bright, but I was like, yes. Yeah. Um, so I remember, and still to this day, I'm like, why is it heavier than it ever used to be? It lasts longer than it ever used to. And I never had painful periods. And now like, I get cramping, which is, it's nothing that I can't, um, uh, help with, uh, fennel tea. Fennel tea really helps me. So it's very mild, but I never used to have that. Right. And I have my clients too. They're like, Hey, do you know why this is happening? I'm like, no, but I'm going to ask the expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's many physiological changes that happen to us through pregnancy and postpartum. So sometimes those physiological changes can be very permanent but you want to look at what hormonal shifts happen to you postpartum and what could still be maybe going on for you. So immediately once our periods return, we do tend to have a few months of really heavy cycles, lots of clotting. They could be all over the place. Like I know with me, one's like 40 days and then it's 29 days. And then it's, you know, and they are very heavy for me as well right now. And I'm just like, holy moly. So my, my period just returned about five months ago. And now I'm finally starting to see them begin to get lighter and more regular. And so, uh, we actually see a lot of women even go anemic once their periods return because it's just so heavy. And wow. that's because your, your hormones are starting to regulate out. They're trying, but you, you probably have this sort of imbalance of estrogen to progesterone where the estrogen is a little bit more dominant Okay. And the estrogen causes that higher pain during your menstrual cycles, more cramping. It causes more like for them to be longer usually or heavier. Um, so we do tend to see this picture and we also tend to see more PMS. And when progesterone is deficient, cycles can be a little bit more irregular. So okay. until that estrogen and that progesterone balances out, which usually takes about three months to happen because okay. the cycle of your egg to mature is about 90 days. Um, then they, it should start to kind of balance out. If it's not, 
that's where you need to go looking at, okay, well, is there still maybe an underlying hormonal thing going on here? And could that hormonal thing be caused by the adrenals? Could it be Mm. caused by thyroid? So we know that when we're under stress, we usually have a more wicked period, right? I don't know if you realize that, like if you go through a period of stress, no, I haven't put two and two together, but I noticed other things that I notice other things in my body that like I have rosacea. So I notice when I'm really stressed, that's when I have flare ups. So inflammation goes up, right? So for you, there might be this inflammatory response that changes and shifts your cycle as well. So everybody's so individual, uh, but the cramping is probably a little bit more of that estrogen. Now, if the cramping is settled with phenyl T, you're probably okay. But if women are reaching to Advil or even needing heating pads because their cycles are like that painful, that's not normal. Okay. Right? And that's something that you should definitely look into regulating and figuring out what's going on. Right. Um, so you have, and even pelvic floor, right. You know, like menstrual cycles could be more heavy, more painful with pelvic floor issues. And obviously mm-hmm. after having babies, women right. need to work on their pelvic floor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So I know for me, like, that's probably even a factor for me because I, was doing the work, but then I stopped doing the work on my pelvic floor. And I'm really starting to feel that now with mm-hmm. my cycles. Okay. Um, I'm starting to feel more of that like rectal pain with cycles, okay. which um, immediately after I delivered, I had a little bit of a rectal prolapse. Okay. And now that my period's returned, I'm feeling that there's something there with my pelvic floor because I'm right. feeling that rectal pain too. Got you. So I know I have to get back into it. So there's these signs to watch for, but it can be very normal for your period to look like you know, a death scene or like (laughs) just be really painful or really regular those first few months. And it's really unfortunate. I just had a patient recently who came in and she said, well, I'm two months, you know, into my period coming back after having a baby. And I just went on the pill. My doctor put me on the pill because they're just so heavy. Mm. And I was like, wait a second. I'm like, it's normal for your periods to be like this right now. Wait another month, Right. wait another two months, see what shifts. Right. And so yeah. it's, it's unfortunate because likely her cycle would have just regulated out. Right. <sighs> what are you going to do so? <laughs> oh, okay. So note to self, I need to book an appointment for you with you to check out what's going on because right. Like, yeah. and, and likely it's just something little Denise, that you just yeah. got a tweak and you're like, Oh, that was it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. otherwise I w- wouldn't have known. Um, because, yeah. because of the low libido and the high, uh, or the heavier periods for sure. And it could be yeah. just a small little fix that you can help me out with. <laughs> yeah. And then just final tips for women for increasing libido. So yes, like regulating your hormones is one thing, getting testing, all that stuff, but also reconnecting with your partner big mm-hmm. time, right? Making sure you're actually scheduling date nights. Yes. That's big for me and my partner. I know. Cause we get so lost in the kids that it's like, when they're not around, it's like, oh yeah, you exist. Right. <laughs> I, I, forgot. I forgot how he actually felt about you. So- my husband, my husband books once a month, a kid free weekend. So we ship them oh, off to my weekend? in-laws, uh, like, like a Friday afternoon or Friday night till Saturday, uh, Sunday noon. And so it is glorious. We go for bike rides and what, like now everything's closed. There's no mall, so we don't go shopping, but it's like bike rides and we spend time outside and it's just, I'm so happy. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's a, I'm going to do that. I was just yeah. going to say, you know, one date night a week or something, but like a whole weekend, that sounds glorious. And like you have, <laughs> you, you have something to look forward to. Even like you said, yeah. like once a week, what do you guys do? Like how, how, what do you do? Is it like when the kids are sleeping or how do you kind of reconnect? So us right now, um, right temporarily, I'm in this acute phase of like working a lot. So I'm working a lot at night because I'm, you know, with the kids all day. And then it's the only time I could do charting. So right now it's, we're scheduling kind of that one, once a week where we go out for dinner, especially now the patios are open. (laughs) So, um, we're definitely doing that, but usually after kids are in bed, that's when we feel like we can actually sit down and reconnect. We may have a glass of wine together. Right. Um, but it's hard. Like it's, not easy, especially because like my son is still sleeping with us. I'm still up mm-hmm. all night, like five times a night with him. So I'm waking oh up exhausted. So I realize like my own energy is playing a role in the dynamic of like our relationship. Yeah. And so I know this needs to change. And so I'm not perfect either. Right. right. So I have these tips and suggestions and I know they work because they work with my patients. They, but they worked, you know, after we had my first son, 
Um, but I know that like our sex life gets so much better when we actually connect and we communicate and we talk, because if you're yes. distant, you're not gonna, you know, it's exactly. It's, yeah. And you also need to work on yourself. Like, it's not just about communicating your partner, but also just self-love self-worth feeling sexy in your own mm -hmm. body in your postpartum body right you know so many women strive to have this like body before pregnancy and I'm just like that's gone okay I like <laughs> it'll you can still look incredible postpartum but you don't you'll never look like that <laughs> it won't be you the know? same but it could be better right it like be better I feel that's like right. I am the strongest and like healthiest and yeah. fittest that I've ever been. Yeah. I, it's funny because we don't, I feel like as soon as you have kids, that's when it's like all this body, you start thinking about it and looking at oh, it. Oh yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I never thought like this when I was a teen. <laughs> it's so funny because we think that our, like our partners think of us like that, but we, and we're making up these stories in our head. Like I look at my body sometimes and I go, Ooh, like that's not very attractive, you know, but um, and then when we go to have intercourse, it's almost kind of like, I try to hide it. Mm. And if my partner is the one who says to me, don't hide it. Like, I love this. And I'm like, right. are you lying? <laughs> like, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's like, we make up these stories in our head, which is, so right. ridiculous. but I love that you said like you, it can be better. And it's so true. Uh, but then also just not putting the pressure on yourself. Yeah. To do that. Right. And just, um, really like practicing self-love it's about feeling healthy. Yeah. Right. And being healthy versus being like this, like skinny mini person yes. or, you know, making sure your breasts are still up here versus down here <laughs> you know? and feeling healthy. Like for everybody is going to be something different for yeah. me. It is being outside after school with my kids. And it just like takes my stress from here to here. And it's just like, oh, I can relax and I can like focus and just everything is like is shutting better. your brain off. Yeah. Right? So like, yeah. so to that end, we should do evening walks a bit more. That's yeah. a way to get my husband out. Hey, if we go for an evening walk. It's all these things is finding out what you love, finding again, what you guys love to do together. Right. And that you haven't been able to do since you've had kids exercise, working with a pelvic floor physio or working with someone like yourself to really work on pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. All of those are going to help with libido, um, right. working on your nutrition, stress relief, mm -hmm. big time stress relief. Yeah. Sleep, I say, oh God, you got to get sleep. But obviously we know that's easier said than done being yeah. postpartum. Yeah. But if you have the opportunity to get to bed at nine, don't go to bed at midnight. You right. Know? Yes. <laughs> go to bed don't at be nine. scrolling. Don't be scrolling yeah. when you could just be getting sleep. Yeah. Exactly. And I know I'm guilty of that sometimes too. My husband's like, why aren't you in bed? And I'm like, because this is literally the only time I have for myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, sometimes it is and so uh, but maybe instead of you know being in front of a tv or on your phone maybe you're taking a bath you're reading a yeah. book that you love just something that's like more um fulfilling to yeah. you versus just depleting your mind and energy even right. more yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but you'll awesome. get there the libido can come back we can come back it's not <laughs> And return so it's just you know finding out where those imbalances are and we're not speaking it we're not in libido jail forever no <laughs> although it feels awesome. that way sometimes yes <laughs> awesome thank you so much for all these tips this was so great i know that moms will be uh rewinding and watching over and over because there's so many tidbits here and there so jess i know you have a lot of stuff on your uh social media tell everybody where they can find you yeah so the best place to find me is probably through my instagram so I'm sure you'll put the link there, but yeah. it's uh, Dr. Jessica DuPont, very easy, Dr. Jessica DuPont, and you'll find me there. That's where I post the most. You can absolutely go to my website, um, drjessicand.com if you're looking to book an appointment. Uh, but Instagram is probably where you're going to find me the most. I have a few upcoming programs, one of them specifically focused on postpartum. I can't give out too much information, but this is going to be, this is a really excited one I'm talking, I'm, I'm really excited for because there is no program out there for postpartum moms that address everything okay. from nutrition, regulating hormones, how to navigate breastfeeding and weaning, how to navigate hair loss. And Ooh, libido. That's a good a whole one. other topic we can do. Today. Yes, it is. Um, but you know, how to, you know, cortisol and all this stuff, because like I said, or like even you said earlier, women, their doctor's appointments stop at six weeks postpartum. 
And that's it. It's like, okay, yeah. well, good luck now. Have fun. <laughs> right. And, and then you're just left to be like, oh, okay. And so really like we need to change that. And women should be getting testing at certain times throughout their postpartum period. So this program is going to talk about that, what to get tested, how to interpret those results, how, what to eat and how to eat, how to regulate your hormones, how to navigate things, what's normal, what's not normal. And so it's really going to take that all encompassing and even it's going to address pelvic floor and all this stuff. And so this is going to be launched in, um, in the fall and it's strictly online. So women can do it at their own pace. Mm -hmm. And I, so it's just going to give women that information that they're looking for, because Dr. Google, as we know, can cause a lot of stress. <laughs> it can cause a lot of overwhelm. Yeah. It's like, well, what supplements do I do at what dose? Like, is exactly. this good for me? Is this not good for me? I don't know. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah. you know, there's too, you're too much on your plate already as a postpartum mom, it needs to be easy laid out. Okay. This is my plan for me right because babies have all these doctor's appointments but what about you yeah exactly right? so i'm really really excited about this one and uh, i'll let you know as soon as that's launched but it'll be yeah and i'll definitely put the link down below when that's out but everybody yeah. you can reach uh dr jess i'll have all her details in um the um description box below where you can reach her so thanks so much, Jess, for coming here and being our expert guest. We learned a lot. Um, I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. You're a vibrant, beautiful self. <laughs> and keep empowering women. It's amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>